tonight on We Are Most Amused. John Cleese. Is there any chance for knighthood? <laughs> Robin Williams. Yo, yo, what's up, Wales? House of Windsor, keeping it real. Rowan Atkinson. Do you do children's parties? <laughs> Bill Bailey. Hey. Omid Jalili. I've uh, come up a bit short because I've been hit by the comedy crunch. John Coleshaw. My fellow amphibians. <laughs> Joan Rivers. Is anybody here a vegan? <laughs> and more. Okay. <laughs> you join us here at the new Wimbledon Theatre as their Royal Highnesses, the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall and Prince Harry arrive to be greeted by hundreds of well-wishers. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all and a very warm welcome on this cold evening to We Are Most Amused, a spectacular evening of comedy in honour of the 60th birthday of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Happy birthday, sir. All the proceeds from tonight's show will go to the Prince's Trust, of which I am proud to be an ambassador, a charity which has helped well over half a million young people since it was formed in 1976. Indeed, Celestine Walcott Gordon, who sang the national anthem tonight, is a fine example of someone who has benefited from the Trust, which continues to support disadvantaged young people all over the country. And so... On with the show, we have a sparkling lineup of comedy stars in store, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce your master of ceremonies for the evening, a true comedy legend. Please welcome John Cleese. <laughs> Thank you, good evening, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special birthday occasion. Actually, I, I've just celebrated a birthday myself. I won't tell you how many. <laughs> uh, so it is my, my very own birthday present uh, to preside here tonight over the celebration of the 60th birthday of His Royal Highness Prince... Charles, you old fool. <laughs> oh, Charles, Prince Charles, Prince Charles. Sorry, 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 I'm sorry. When I, was, when I was very young, every year my parents and I would gather round the television set with a sense of anticipation to watch the Royal Variety Show. And every year, after about 20 minutes, we'd turn to each other and say, this is even worse than last year, isn't it? <laughs> How do they do it? So, tonight, I would like to make an apology uh, on behalf of British show business to you, sir, and to your long-suffering family, too. <laughs> for the atrocities that have been visited upon you in the name of entertainment. Not that tonight's show is any better, frankly, because 
I've been watching rehearsals. Dreadful, really. <laughs> a lot of young people I've never heard of who aren't very good, I'm afraid, but... Uh, <laughs> never forget, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> now, our next act is a bludgeoning young talent. Bludgeoning? <laughs> oh, oh, you know the type. Utterly ruthless, you know. Climb all over you. Give him half a chance. <laughs> Who is this despicable individual? Oh, Michael McIntyre. Oh, he's Scottish. That explains it. So, uh, all the way from the Highlands, let's give a big hand to the wee man from the tenements. Will you please welcome the new Mr. Malcolm McIntosh? What a tremendous evening. You all look so smart in the presence of royalty. <laughs> oh, Prince Charles, hi. Hi. So, um, I'm going to pretend you're not here. So... <laughs> I can't! Hi! Um, so we just got put up in a nice hotel today, uh, just around the corner. You know a nice hotel, because it has a turning down service. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this, basically, rich people require poor people to come into their room before Betty <laughs> and peel the bed open just a little bit <laughs> and pop a jockey on the pillow. <laughs> Otherwise, they can't get in. They don't know what to do. <laughs> They're just clapping at this clapping. There's no hook, there's no confectionery, I don't know what to do! <laughs> so you've all got your seats. It's always quite tense, isn't it, when you're in the theatre? Because sometimes you, you, people want to arrive in chronological order, but sometimes you arrive and there are seats left over, and you know other people are going to come, so you can't quite relax, and then you think people are coming, and then they walk past, and then they, when they do arrive, you have the choice. Stand or twizzle. It's a huge moment. <laughs> Some people just arch their back. It doesn't help. They just want to show they've done something, so they just go, OK. <laughs> Will that help on some level? <laughs> Sometimes you get directions to your seat, totally unnecessarily. When you get on an aeroplane, there'll be a stewardess who looks at your ticket and then gives you directions to your seat. You've probably seen planes, right? Long tube things. <laughs> they go from seat one to however long the plane is. I've managed to dress myself and pay for the ticket. <laughs> You think I need you to go 13, straight down there. 42, straight down there. 16, straight down there. Oh, thank God you were here. Last time, no one was here. I was in the locker for half an hour. Are you kidding? Sometimes you get taken, taken to a seat. Also, unnecessarily, like in a breakfast buffet, you go to a, like a buffet. Buffet, by the way, is too exciting for British people. You see the buffet, you want to, you just look at it. How can I get all this food in me? <laughs> when you can order, you order one thing. When you see the buffet, I want everything. I want eggs and bacon and ham. I want ham. I want mini cheese. I've never had mini cheese at breakfast. I want muesli. You want everything. But you do get some exercise because you get taken to your seat, right? Somebody will meet you, then walk with you past the buffet, all the way to a seat, sit you down. As soon as you sat down, you remember it's a buffet. You get up immediately <laughs> and go back to the buffet. It's a completely wasted walk. One by one, you see people coming in. <laughs> buffet! <laughs> Sometimes couples can't quite cope with it. They'll come and sit, stare at each other for a bit before concluding, let's go to the buffet. <laughs> It's November, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, November's an odd month. People spend the whole of November basically saying, I can't believe it's November. <laughs> I can't believe it's November. Can you believe that it's November? <laughs> well, yes, you see, we've had all the other months. You see how it works? <laughs> if we'd just come out of April, you'd have a point. What are you talking about? <laughs> Why do we live every year the same way and can't come to terms with the effects it has? The clocks go back. It's such a hugely strange night for everybody. You spend the whole of Sunday slightly jet-lagged. Yeah. And you spend the whole of the first week at five o'clock at the window going, look, look how dark it is. <laughs> it's only five o'clock and look at the results. <laughs> so December will come, right? December, we're all in December. Christmassy is a huge part of December. Christmassy. Everyone will be discussing this emotion of Christmassy. I don't know what it is about this year. I just don't feel Christmassy. Do you feel Christmassy? I haven't felt this. Tommy should ask that. I was just saying the other day, I don't feel Christmassy. <laughs> At some point in December, there will be an announcement. Today, I felt Christmassy for the first time. 
Then when we get to Christmas, we have to get to the New Year, right? Christmas and New Year are separated by six days, between the 25th of December and the 31st. The strangest six days in the whole year. Nobody has a clue who they are. All rules have been suspended. People eat a lot of turkey sandwich. You start putting vegetables into sandwiches. You would never normally do this. <laughs> You're like, I want a turkey sandwich. I want a turkey sandwich. Is there post today? Is the post come today? <laughs> what day is it? Do you know what day it is? I don't even know what day it is. I want another turkey sandwich. When did the bidding get taken away? <laughs> Should I start my diet? I think the shop's open. Have the sale started? <laughs> Can I park here? Can I park here today? <laughs> The post. I think I just heard the post. I want another turkey sandwich. What time is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? I want to watch. <laughs> if somebody said to you in June, do you want to watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? You'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Ladies and Gentlemen, Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Still to come, Bill Bailey. Robin Williams. Welcome back to We Are Most Amused, where a veritable cornucopia of comedy talent have all gathered to celebrate the 60th birthday of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Now, obviously, not everyone who wanted to come could make it, so some have sent messages like this one. Hi there, Simon Cowell with you, Britain's highest paid Thunderbird puppet. <laughs> Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies, gentlemen, groups, over 25s, Danny. <laughs> Sir, have a fantastic evening and a great, great show, which I know will be world class, OK? It would have been better with Journey South and Same Difference on the bill, but hey, that's your loss. I'm just being honest. <laughs> However... Sir, if you ever do want to appear on The X Factor, then I am more than happy to discuss the right song choices I feel could work for you. In fact... Do you know something? I think the public would really like you. I do. I've made a decision. It's good news. Three yeses. You're coming to London. Well done, kiddo. <laughs> Mr. Simon Cowell, I don't know if it's my age, but all these celebrities are beginning to look the same to me. <laughs> oh, that's clever. <laughs> oh, do, is it all right if I explain that to the audience? Oh, oh, oh terrific. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we've all been the victims of an elaborate hoax. <laughs> that wasn't Simon Cowell at all. <laughs> no, no, it was an impressionist called John Colesaw. <laughs> Does impressions, you see. Yes, yes. I do impressions too. Um, here's one. Man waiting for the evening to end. <laughs> oh well, better get on with it. The sooner I do, the sooner we'll all be finished. Now, um, ah, yes, please welcome someone um, of whom I've been a huge fan ever since I Googled him ten minutes ago. You know. <laughs> Music has always played an important part in the life of the Prince of Wales. So much so, I suggest he goes home now. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Mr. Billy Bell. Hello. 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 Uh, good evening, Bill Bailey. Um, thank you. <laughs> We're living in very tense times. I, I find myself increasingly more tense and mistrustful. <laughs> it's the joggers I don't trust, because they're always the ones that find the bodies, aren't they? <laughs> Coincidence? I don't think so. I was in the supermarket, I was at one of the new self-service tills. You know the ones with the two extra members of staff hanging around? <laughs> to deal with the slack-jawed Luddites as they pour ineffectually at the screen like a cat when a mouse comes on the TV. <laughs> and suddenly there was this terrifying voice, unexpected item in the bagging area! <laughs> 
and it was me. <laughs> I was walking in my street, and um, I get recognised sometimes. People thought, some of these thought I was Shakira. And, uh, <laughs> it's the hips. They don't lie. And, two hoodies appeared. They're quite scary, scary, aren't they? Intimidating. One of them said, are you that bloke? And I said, only you can answer that. <laughs> and his mate said, are you that bloke off the TV? And I said, yes. And he said, what are you doing walking around like normal? <laughs> like he thought I should be hovering. So I was a little bit scared because they were outside my house. I thought I'd better change my doorbell because uh, I wanted to deter unwanted callers. Most doorbells are quite friendly, aren't they? Well, they're quite nice. Or, you know, maybe not that one if you've got an abduction complex. <laughs> and that's actually the Pope's doorbell. <laughs> in the Vatican hoping someone's going to ring. Come on, come on, come on. Who the fuck? And the fuck? Who the fuck? And the fuck? <laughs> My only job I ever had, I had a job, I was very, I was briefly, I was a, a crematorium organist. And uh, it's quite an easy job. You just play one chord and change a note every now and again. The reason I got fired, I never knew what, quite what to play at the end of, of the ceremony when the curtains go back. And now we commit Edith's body to the flames. <laughs> and then I got a job in a jazz trio. Wow. Think about playing jazz, you can play any kind of chord you like. Nonsense, really. People are going, yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, most of jazz sounds like a surrealist car alarm. <laughs> the thing about playing in the jazz trio was I used to get bored, so to stop myself from going insane, I would slip in music that I'd rather be playing surreptitiously. And that, I think, would make a fantastic national anthem, wouldn't it? That'd be great. Imagine the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Out come the United Kingdom. <laughs> We're the cool country. Because <laughs> I always feel sorry for those Eastern European countries at the Olympics. Because they've got rotten national anthems, don't they? Here comes Belarus. <laughs> fighting over a pineapple. <laughs> we don't have pineapple in Belarus. Where did they get it from? <laughs> Come to Belarus, where wild animals will steal your fruit. <laughs> On the way, have a great night. Good. Maybe the evening's beginning to look up. Because you know, <laughs> just to be serious, just for a moment, what better tribute to the heir to the throne of this formerly great country could there be? <laughs> that we should bring him here tonight to a cramped old theatre somewhere in the godforsaken suburb. <laughs> a theatre that no one in this audience had heard of before the <laughs> And then watch him like a hawk to see if he laughs at anything. 
How very relaxing for him, you know? <laughs> Real chance to unwind. I bet when the Duchess of Cornwall told you, sir, that she had a couple of tickets for Wimbledon, you thought you were in for a treat. <laughs> so on we plow. It's time to go over now to the This Morning studio, whatever that is, where Philip Scrofield and Femme Britain are offering <laughs> advice to anyone faced with the prospect of turning 60. 60, eh? Those were the days. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Now, this morning we're looking at ageing and more particularly what happens to people when they reach that special milestone age of 60. Yeah, turning 60 can be the start of a wonderful new phase in life. But despite that, some people are also concerned about it because you hit 60 and you instantly start to worry about things like, will my memory start to get worse? Will my hair turn grey? And will my memory start to get worse? So, joining us now is an expert on ageing who will set everybody's minds at rest and tell us all the things that we have to look forward to in our more mature years. So please welcome Dr Simon Everett. Good morning, Simon. Uh, good morning, Richard and Judy. <laughs> Could you start by telling us what's the most common question you're asked by people about to turn 60? Of course. Well, many people feel that it's the beginning <laughs> of the end. So they say things to me like, um, Doctor, is my life over? And the simple answer is, yes, it is. Because you mean that as a joke? <laughs> no, I don't. No, obviously, I don't tell them that. No, I make up some guff about how turning 60 is a great time to make a new start. And indeed, many do start. Uh, start to moan about their aches and pains. Start to wear beige. And to some extent, start to dribble. Yeah, well, I, I know that people do become less active with age, Doctor, but there's surely more to turning 60 than that. Yes, yes, I've got an email here. Um, this one is from two old mates, Mick and Keith. Mick is 65, Keith's 64. They say they remain pretty active and they do lots of travelling around. Um, Keith apparently fell out of a tree not so long ago. And they say their friend Ronnie, who's 61, is still a very keen bird fancier. <laughs> There you go. And if you're watching, fellas, that's the spirit. Yeah. If they are watching, they'd have probably nodded off by now. Well, hang on a second. There's a letter here. Uh, this is from a, uh, from a guy called Bruce, who says he can't even remember being 60. Oh. <laughs> so sad, isn't it? No, no, he says he can't remember because it was so long ago. Bruce says he's 80. He's still managing to hold down a Saturday job, which is nice to see. To see nice. And he goes on to say, I'm not doddery. I can't make out the last bit. The handwriting's a bit shaky, but anyway, great stuff. Bruce, well done. Mm. And, and I've got another letter here. This one's written on recycled organic paper, mm. and it's from a gentleman called Charles. He's just coming up to the big 6 0. He's kept constantly busy helping his mum run the family business, and in his spare time, he enjoys making his own biscuits. <laughs> what did you say to him? It's obvious to me that you're rather confused. <laughs> you probably think you've built your own village. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor. It would appear that people just don't agree with you. Uh, life used to begin at 40, but these days it looks like 60 is the new 40. Yeah, so there you have it. There are lots of positives to being in your sexy 60s. Um, no, can't think of any. <laughs> and I'm the expert. <laughs> Doctor Abbott, thank you very much indeed. You'll stay with us after the break? Oh, I'd love to, but no. Um, my girlfriend's over there. It's beautiful. Only 27. Hi, honey. <laughs> Tiger. <sighs> Still to come, Robin Williams and Rowan Atkinson. Now, before I go on, I, I just want to thank you all so much for making the effort to be here tonight when you could have been at home enjoying yourself. <laughs> it's the kind of self-sacrifice that makes this country the greatest country in the British Isles. <laughs> now, we're on. Oh, yes, our next act is someone I've actually heard of, an old friend of mine, star of uh, Good Morning Vietnam, the Dead Poets Society, and Mrs. Doubtfire, yes. A big hand, please, for Mr. William Robbins. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Robbie Williams. Mr. Mr. Robbie Williams.
Chuck, Cam, great to see you. <laughs> yo, yo, what's up, Wales? House of Windsor, keeping it real? <laughs> Obama, yeah! <laughs> yes, indeed, yeah! The dream came true, great God Almighty, the dream came true! Obama, Obama, Obama! <laughs> Obama, yeah! Barack, which means blessing, Hussein, don't ask. <laughs> Obama, which is an old Kenyan word for Kennedy, God bless us. <laughs> and a lot of Irish people are going, he's black Irish, he's an Obama. <laughs> but he is an eloquent, eloquent man. I know at the inauguration, people are hoping that maybe he kicks it up a notch going, what's up, Washington? <laughs> yo, 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 let's keep it real right now. I'm gonna bring out the members of my political posse, my cabinet right now. This is little Ray Ray. <laughs> This is G-Man Kanye Kobe and Colin Powell, who is bad to the bone. <laughs> We're going down Pennsylvania Avenue with the top down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to build a basketball court in the Rose Garden. <laughs> but we do have to take a moment of silence and bid a fond farewell to George W. Bush. Yes, it's the end of the reign of George II. <laughs> the reign of error is over. America is officially out of rehab. Welcome us. We have come back. Thank you. He is a gift to comedy, though. He is a comedy pinata. I'm going to miss him. A man who said, I'm the decider. No, sir, you're the president. You make decisions. Decider is what they sell in the little jugs. A lot of people... He also said, I am misunderestimated. And I went, no, not really. <laughs> and you think, what is he, what, I have to think, what is he going to do after he leaves office? No, he cannot go on a speaking tour. That's a given. <laughs> but I do think he could do stand-up comedy because he has eight years of amazing material. <laughs> he has stuff, and here's some of W's greatest hits. The question that's never asked, is our children learning? <laughs> I just found out that a lot of our imports come from other countries. <laughs> America, a country where you can put food on your family. <laughs> our enemies are looking for terrible ways to destroy this country, and so are we. <laughs> and you have to have a little sympathy, though. W comes from a family where the smart brother is named Jeb, so you have to kind of... <laughs> take a moment, just have a little moment of silence. And you can't blame the economy on him. They say the economy is essentially sound because people are considering buying things. That's like saying fat people are healthy because they might exercise. <laughs> but no, we need help. We went to the world. I like the fact the American government went all around the world and the French were going, I feel so bad for you, huh? <laughs> so good. $750 billion they can spare. And I'm going, the only people in the world, the Saudis. The Saudi, can you spare seven? I will give you $750 billion. All I want is a picture of Angelina Jolie and Louis Walsh. <laughs> I changed that reference for England. Thank God that worked. Thank you. <laughs> but it was the economy, the whole thing, and the whole debate. Basically, it was we had Obama, Fresh Prince, McCain, Uncle Fester on the Adams family. <laughs> And the debates were so amazing. The first debate, two people speaking in complete sentences after eight years of W, I was going, thank you, God! <laughs> I was beginning to think our electoral process was like the Special Olympics of politics. I was like, no! The second debate, McCain started to get a little like, mm -hmm, ah, that one! <laughs> and then the third debate, oh, wow, McCain was just like, da -da, mm -hmm. <laughs> He starts to look like your uncle who's on a new drug and he hasn't got the dosage right. <laughs> And you find him wandering around the mall, going, I've got a plan! <laughs> I know where Osama is, tell us. I'm not gonna tell you yet! <laughs> Where's the plumber? Where's Joe? Where's the plumber? Get in the car, Uncle John, get in the car. <laughs> but it was pretty wild, that whole concept. What is he doing there? That's like, and where? Where did they get Sarah Palin? Where did they find her? <laughs> wow! Did Ronald Reagan have a kid with Posh Spice? I don't know. It's like, she. It's like she came 
from some sort of reality show, Project Running Mate. Here she comes. Here comes Sarah. Her hobbies are breastfeeding and helicopter hunting. She can skin a moose and balance a budget. Come on down. With that shucks and all kind of, oh my gosh, oh shucks. Polar bears are not endangered. They're just unlucky. Come on. Amazing, too. The last few days of the election, she let her hair down, she took her glasses off. I thought the last day she'd just be like, check it out. How do you like my northern slopes now, boy? Drill, baby, drill, drill. You think Bill Clinton was sitting at home the whole time going, where was she when I was in office? Damn. What's up? And Bill has some bad luck. He found the only Jewish girl who couldn't get a stain out. That is so sad. Like, e -e -e. But the whole thing is, American politics are always crazy. I live in California. We're a 60% Hispanic state. We have an Austrian governor. Even old Nazis are going, that's weird. That is not right. And Arnold could be president if it wasn't for that tiny clause. If you're not born in America, you can't run for president. Arnold, the little immigrant boy who had a dream and a vial of anabolic steroids. <laughs> and he lives with and married to Maria Shriver, who's a Kennedy, who's getting smaller and smaller. I believe he's living off of her. I believe he's sucking the Kennedy out of her slowly but surely. And that's why he's become a moderate Republican, which is kind of cool. It's like a Volvo with a gun rack. You don't see a lot of it. <laughs> But, I was thinking, maybe there's one person, and I want to get a guy out there running, you know, when Sarah and people talk, who can we get that would run and make the whole world go, oh, wow? And that guy would be Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, baby. He has got cooler movies than Arnold. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> we'll never have a sex scandal with Jack. He's done everybody. <laughs> I had Angelina Jolie, and afterwards, she adopted me. <laughs> and you'll never have a drug scandal. Jack has done every drug known to mankind. He's the only guy in the world that Keith Richards would go, I have to go home now, Jack. <laughs> but I'll leave you right now, because some people see that I look like Bono, and I have to say, stop drinking. But recently, Bono was on stage in Scotland, and it was very quiet, like right now. And he started clapping his hands, and he clapped his hands, and he said, every time I clap my hands, a child in Africa dies. And from the back of the Scottish audience, someone went, then stop clapping your hands! <laughs> Good night, thank you, sir! Good evening, and here is the news from 1948. Hello, and here's your 2008 news roundup. The Labour Party has unveiled ambitious plans to create a national health service that offers clean, safe, infection-free health care for all. This will be achieved through the radical use of taxpayers' money. The Health Minister has unveiled ambitious plans to transform the National Health Service back into something that offers clean, safe, infection-free <laughs> health care for all. This will be achieved through the radical use of hot, soapy water and some mops. <laughs> Travel, and it has been predicted that with the creation of a new kind of road called a motorway, cars will be able to travel from London and arrive just five hours later in Edinburgh. Travel, and it's been predicted that with the creation of additional lanes on motorways, cars will be able to travel from London and arrive just five hours later in Watford. <laughs> Art. And today at Sotheby's, an antique painting found under a pile of old clothes, rubble and broken bottles was auctioned for almost a thousand pounds. Art. And today at Sotheby's, a pile of old clothes, rubble and broken <laughs> bottles... You're ahead of me. Was... <laughs> was auctioned for almost 10 million pounds. The economy, and it emerged today that the average house price is now 1,700 pounds. 
The Economy, and it emerged today that the average house price is now £1,700. Football and England international Billy Wright has broken his ankle in a training session. He will now miss several matches, seriously affecting the promotion chances of the club. Football and England international David Beckham has broken his fingernail in a tanning session. <laughs> He will now miss several photo shoots, seriously affecting the promotion campaign of his skincare range. Cricket, and the England side has been soundly beaten by the visiting Australians. The MCC has pledged that this humiliating debacle shall never happen ever again. Cricket, and oh, don't ask. Finally, on the 14th of November, 1948, his newly born Royal Highness Prince Charles burped contentedly, rolled over and fell soundly asleep. And 60 years later, if this sketch goes on for much longer, <laughs> he'll probably do exactly the same. Happy birthday, Happy Your Royal birthday, Highness. Your Royal Highness. Still to come, Stephen K. Amos and Rowan Atkinson. Welcome back to We Are Most Amused, where I hope you'll agree we've gathered together some of the greatest names in comedy, all under one roof. And there is something for everyone. Whether you like sketches or stand-up or musical comedy, we've got something for you. And there's lots more still to come. So let's cross back into the auditorium now, see what's next. Now, before I introduce the next act, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you, sir, and I realise this is possibly not the very best moment, uh, but I was wondering, and I'm sure you get this all the time, um, is there any chance of a knighthood? <laughs> give me the card. Give me the card. Don't. Give don't. Me, give me the card. Take them off. I sh Take them off. I, I, I knew I shouldn't have gone private. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me welcome, actually, please welcome, Stephen K. Amos. Thank you, thank you very much. What a very lovely, warm welcome. Can I just also point out, as the only black man on the bill, if you don't laugh, maybe you're a little bit racist. <laughs> well done, joke number one. <laughs> Basically, ladies and gentlemen, I've been travelling around this great country of ours and seeing some very funny things. I went up north, went to Leeds. Anybody here from Leeds? Yeah. Oh, one person in the front. <laughs> I drove up to Leeds, because that's right, folks, I do own a car. Check me. <laughs> and as you get to Leeds, there's a great big sign on the motorway. It said, Leeds, city full of surprises. I was there eight hours, nothing. <laughs> Maybe that's the surprise. I get to the show, in the front row, 12 stunning blonde ladies. They were quite clearly on some sort of Hindu, because 11 of them were dressed as Indians. <laughs> Feather in their hair. One of them was wearing a sari. <laughs> now, I'm not a member of Mensa, but I'm guessing she wasn't the sharpest tool in the box. <laughs> Can you imagine her getting that phone call? Yeah, Sarah's do. We're all going as Indians. I'll see you there. <laughs> At the same show, to my left, four guys, big guys. I said, right, sir, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a teacher. I said, is it a mixed school? He said, no, they're all white. <laughs> See, my face must have gone. Because he went, ah! <laughs> But I saw the funny side. I was there in Leeds for two days. I thought, I'm going to try and, and, and amuse myself. I go to the cinema. I wasn't banking on meeting odd folk. I walked down the street. I stopped a lady. Excuse me, where is the local cinema? She looked me in the eye and she went, are you from around here? Uh, uh, no, the clue is in my question to you. <laughs> so I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll pretend I've lost my voice. I'll pretend I can't speak. I'll buy a pad and pen, I'll get by. I wasn't banking on meeting odd folk. With pad and pen in hand, I walk down a few streets, I find the cinema, I pick my film. On the pad I wrote, due to bad throat, cannot speak, would like to watch a film. Gave the pad to the guy behind the counter. He took it, read it, laughed, took my pen... And on the same pad, he wrote, what would you like to see? <laughs> I 
took back my patent, patent pen and I wrote, although I cannot speak, I am not deaf. <laughs> he takes back my patent pen and he writes, sorry. <laughs> These are the strange people I don't want to see. <laughs> Whenever I play America, the Americans don't get me, for example, right? Because apparently in America, my face doesn't fit my voice. This is my face. <laughs> this is my voice. Deal with it. I went to New York, a place called Harlem. Mm, yeah! I had the walk down pat. I was giving it all that. I went into a bank and I said, Excuse me. One would like to exchange a traveler's check. The girl behind the desk went, Say what? I'd like to exchange a traveler's checks. And she goes, Hold on, hold on. Alopecia, get over here. Anaconda, get over here. Now, say it again. I'd like to exchange these traveler's checks. Hey, are you from France? <laughs> I was confused. But whenever I meet people, I always try and make a connection. Because I don't like to be judged, right? I did a show and in the centre of London. didn't go very well. It didn't go well at all. I got very, very drunk. And at one o'clock in the morning, I'm staggering home. And in the distance, I spot a little old lady. And folks, as she clocks me, she clutches her handbag thus. Something inside me died, folks. So I went over to the little old lady and I took that handbag. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> Half of you are going, oh my God. <laughs> what on earth is that Negro talking about? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Don't, don't worry about me. I, I can't feel a thing. That, <laughs> excuse me. It is water. Water, please. question for you. Si. What is the eleventh letter of the English alphabet? K. <laughs> now run for it, you stupid... <laughs> <laughs> what? Go away, go away. In fact, what we thought what we'd like to do next is, is to try and get into the Guinness Book of Records for the longest sketch ever performed to a live audience. <laughs> and who better to stretch it out for hours than our next guest? He's a veteran of several great television shows, mostly based on old ideas of mine. He's also outstandingly good at Vickers. Please welcome the voluptuous Rowan Atkinson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Our lesson this evening is taken from the Gospel according to St. John. Chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. <laughs> and on the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And it came to pass that all the wine was drunk. And the mother of Jesus said unto the Lord, They have no more wine. <laughs> and Jesus said unto the servants, Fill six water pots with water. And they did so. And when the steward of the feast 
did taste of the water from the pots, it had become wine. And he knew not whence <laughs> it had come. But the servants did know. <laughs> and they applauded loudly in the kitchen. And they said unto the Lord, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> and inquired of him, do you do children's parties? <laughs> and the Lord said, no. <laughs> but the servants did press him, saying, go on, give us another one. <laughs> and so he brought forth a carrot and said behold this for it is a carrot and all about him knew that it was so for it was orange <laughs> with a green top and he did place a large red cloth over the carrot and then removed it and lo he held in his hand a white rabbit and all were amazed and said, this guy is really good. He should turn professional. And there came unto him a woman called Mary, who had seen the Lord and believed. And Jesus said unto her, put on a tutu and lie down in this box. And then took he forth a saw and cleft her in twain. And there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth. But Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith. And he threw open the box, and lo, Mary was whole. And the crowd went absolutely bananas. And Jesus and Mary took a big bow. And he said unto her, from now on, you shall be known as Sharon. <laughs> for that is a good name for an assistant. <laughs> and the people said unto him, we've never seen anything like this. <laughs> this is great. You shouldn't be wasting your time in a small one camel town like Cana. You should be playing the big arena in Jerusalem. <laughs> and Jesus did hearken unto their words. And he did go unto Jerusalem. And he did his full act before the scribes and the Pharisees and the Romans. But alas, it did not please them in their hearts. In fact, they absolutely crucified him. <laughs> Here ends the lesson. Right, we're going to take a break for the X Factor results now, but stick around, there's still plenty more to come when we are most amused returns. There's more from John Cleese. We're going to take the gag off Joan Rivers and Robin Williams returns, plus there's a special secret guest. So we'll see you at 10.20 after the X Factor results. Welcome back to We Are Most Amused, a riotous night of comedy, all in aid of the Prince's Trust. Earlier tonight, we saw Michael McIntyre, Rowan Atkinson, Bill Bailey, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Coming up, we've got Joan Rivers unleashed, Robin Williams singing a unique birthday tribute to the Prince, and a musical finale led by another comedy great. There's lots more still to come, so let's cross back into the auditorium and find out what's next. <laughs> My fellow amphibians. <laughs> it is a great honorization <laughs> to have been asked to come here tonight, even though I have retired. 
As you are, no doubt, underwear. <laughs> we have a new precipice of the United States. <laughs> and I wish Borat Bahamas all the best. <laughs> they say Borat has made hysterectomy. <laughs> As the first man of mixed parents to come to the top job. Not so. My parents were mixed a lady and a man. <clears throat> So what I should say is, on behalf of all Americans, congratulated to your royal high five <laughs> on this, your very special 16th birthday. <laughs> and as I give my official farewell tonight, I pledge to do everything in my power to make a smooth transition from myself to the new president. In fact, if I don't hunch my shoulders and speak through my nose and speak through my chest instead, I can even sound like Barack Obama. <laughs> I will use my emotive words, hope, inspiration, change, look into the future with hope in our hearts at this defining moment. We cannot turn back, America, we cannot turn back. Oh, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> you know something? Being a world statesman's been kind of fun. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> Keep on trucking. Thank you and good night. President George W. Bush. Uh, the W, of course, stands for what a bloody disaster. <laughs> Seriously, you may wonder how Mr. Bush could find the time to fly here today when he's still nominally president. Well, it's because Cheney wants him out of the way so that he can bomb Iran. And <laughs> talking of Iran brings us to our next performer. Om... 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 Om Jalili? Is that an anagram? <laughs> Anyway, I can safely say that, um, what's his name, is the funniest Iranian comedian in the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, please shift uneasily in your seat. <laughs> and keep a very, very close eye on this fellow. Thank you, what a, what a warm welcome. You know, backstage, they really make me feel so welcome here. You know, we had a silver service dinner and they made sure that I was the only one with plastic cutlery. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But Mr. Cleese insults me because in the Middle East, names are very important. You don't get the name right, it's very bad. Because my name is a very powerful name. Omid Jalili is very powerful. You know, Omid means hope. It's just a shame that Jalili means less. I don't know why I'm talking like this. Hello. Hello. Hi. It's me. Hi. I never know how to start, ladies and gentlemen, because I, I used to do, I used to start with an accent to, to say something about my culture. I used to talk like this. You know, it's very, I'm not a fan to talk like this. You know? <laughs> Being from the Middle East, we don't know much about comedy. We, we don't even know basic joke construction. <laughs> like for you, an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman, that's a joke. To us, that's a hostage situation. <laughs> He likes all this stuff, don't worry about it. <laughs> because I have done the Royal Variety performance twice, both times Prince Charles was there. Now to me, that's not variety. <laughs> Another Royal event, who's here? of Spain, mix it up a bit. <laughs> you don't have to keep watching Iranians. That's why you pay MI6 for, my friend. That's why you pay them. Leave me alone. 
course, Barack Obama. Isn't that wonderful? Everyone says his name right. It's such a, such a powerfully ethnic name. And we all say it so trippingly off the tongue. Barack Obama. Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> but here's the thing is, he's, he's Kenyan. He's half Kenyan. But we can't say the name of the Kenyan president because his name is Wacky Backy. <laughs> Now, the funny thing here is not the fact that his name is Wacky Backy. It's a euphemism for uh, marijuana. It's the fact that his name is Wacky Backy, but the BBC News presenters refused to call him Wacky Backy because they think it's racist. They said, today, the Kenyan president, mm, Wacky Backy. <laughs> arrived in London with his foreign secretary, Mr. Hughes <laughs> and his Minister for Interiors, Mr. Afansi El Mazda! <laughs> this brings up a very important question in our society. Where is the line between being racist and playing with race, you see? Now, for me, it's very simple. If you ever get into a, a trouble, if, you get into, if ever a Nigerian traffic warden gives you a ticket unfairly, don't call him names. What you can do is speak back at him in his own accent, okay? <laughs> I got a ticket. The man said, I'm going to give you a ticket. I said, what? What have I done? <laughs> I suffer from a condition called Nigerianitis, actually. Well, you speak in a Nigerian voice for no reason. I actually went to the doctor. I said, Doctor, I think I suffer from a condition called Nigerianitis. And the doctor said, What are you talking about? I said, Oh my God, it's contagious. He said, No, sir, I'm from Nigeria. Why are you talking like that? I said, Why are you talking like that? It's hard to differentiate who's saying what in this routine. <laughs> but then the doctor said, Doctor! Oh, that's wrong. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait! We'll cut that bit up. <laughs> the doctor said, Let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, Go ahead! yourself smiling to yourself most of the time for no reason? I said, yes! <laughs> he said, do you find yourself wearing flowery, multicolored shirts in the winter time? I said, yes! He said, I don't think it's Nigerianitis. It could be a mild form of gonorrhea. <laughs> thought that you'd seen the last of the Americans, but apparently Robin Williams is still here and he's refusing to leave the chair. <laughs> Till he's done something else, and furthermore, he's taken Bill Bailey hostage until we agree to his demands. Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Williams and Bill Bailey. <laughs> We've got something real special, Bill. Tell we're going to do right now. We're going to sing a little song for you. We've written specially for tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Camilla lights a candle. <laughs> starts to turn around. Charles, what is it, baby? <laughs> you seem kind of down. <laughs> you say it. It don't seem fair And it just ain't much fun When your mama's got two birthdays And you only got one <laughs> You got the wrong birthday blue. Blue. That lack of an official birthday blue All the formerly known as the Prince of Wales, yeah <laughs> Philip takes a drink of wine <laughs> 
and tells it like it was. This is what you have to do, my boy. And here's the thing, because one day you're gonna rule the world, but you're gonna have to hang around. Cause your mama's not going anywhere. She ain't giving up that crown. You got to roll with the blues. They're gonna creep up on you just like that. Yeah, you really, you really been paying your royal due. Well, in and out and up and down. That's the way the money goes. And well, where the pound will finally stop, nobody. That what really ain't that funny is when your face even ain't on the money. <laughs> They've got badgers and lizards and hedgehogs and squirrels and even Darwin too. They ain't even got one elegant Scottish Hebrew, Disraeli, I think. But the one thing that ain't on the money that definitely ain't on the money. I don't know, it's strange that you ain't even on the change. No. <laughs> That you're not on the pence. Uh -uh. I never found you on the pound. No, I never found you on the pound. Not even a lottery ticket or a subway token, anything around that. There ain't nothing on the money. You ain't definitely on the money. The one thing that ain't on the money. Still to come, Joan Rivers and a very special finale. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say, ladies and gentlemen, that we're almost halfway through. You should have seen the look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, sir, we're nearly there. <laughs> Before we can all go home, we have to sit through yet another act. And our next guest is a new face, Miss Joan Rivers. <laughs> Joan Rivers? I thought she was dead. <laughs> well, perhaps she is. Let's see. Miss Joan Rivers. Shut up! Don't do me any favours. Just don't do me... A... I have to carry out my own dance. Oh, look at the stool. Not that I'm old. Look at the stool. <laughs> This, I just want to show you, um, this is my dog. I, I have two dogs. Uh, one dog I didn't bring with me because she just lost a leg. This is the honest to God truth. And I almost didn't show up because of that. And then, thank God how things work out. Paul McCartney's dog called her for a date, so I felt much better. And I, I, that's all. Wait, it's going to get worse. And dog and my dog is dead and it's your fault England because you won't let the dogs in without vernacular and I couldn't leave this dog this is my dog Spike he was a Yorkie he was like the posh of Yorkies a little thin but I loved him very much and he was 17 years old and he'd been through my husband's suicide with me and all kinds of ups and downs and you can't leave a dog you know what I mean so I killed him and now he comes with me and he still does tricks, watch. Play dead. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's a, actually, by the way, if anybody here is um, upset about my dog, is anybody here a vegan? <laughs> I hate vegans. <laughs> I won't eat anything with eyes. What about your husband? <laughs> Thank God, compared to me. 
I, there are no old people in the front row, thank God. I hate old people. Anybody old? You're almost there. It's, it's <laughs> and old people that buy in bulk, why? Why are you buying in bulk? <laughs> You're 165 years old, you old asshole. Why are you buying in bulk? You got 17 jars of mayonnaise. You're not gonna make it through the checkout line. <laughs> Sandwiches, you're done. I'm sorry. Hey, Ollie, I just went to my 50th reunion. Ugh, women dancing with urns. It was so depressing. <laughs> they were wearing signs. Hello, I used to be. It was just. And one bitch came over to me. You look just like you always did. You haven't changed. I slapped her. I have spent $125,000. on plastic surgery. And you know when it's too much? When you go to the bathroom, you have to wipe your ears. That's when you stop. <laughs> Even plastic surgery doesn't help when you have no sex appeal. I have no sex appeal, yes. Yes, Great Britain. No, don't be kind. I'm a Jew. <laughs> One person, pat your dog, shut up. I, I, I'm a Jewish 10, which is a three with money. I have no... <laughs> Okay? And it's sad. Because old sex, which should cheer everybody up that's getting a little older, is the best. I don't know how many of you are over 60 here. Old sex, better than sex at 20. How about that? Better. First of all, we don't have to change our sheets. The nurses do it for us. And yes, how about that? And we do not have one night stands. No, 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 no. When you're over 60, no, no. Just to get the old guy out of the car, into the house, up the stairs, on the bed, on you, off of you, down the stairs, re diapered and back in the car. Minimum four days. Four days. <laughs> My generation never was told about sex and probably, I knew nothing, all right? Okay? I don't know how many of you knew. I went to my wedding night, both of us. We had never been with anybody. I, I came out of the bathroom. He said to me, let me help you with the buttons. I said, I'm naked. It was just... <laughs> I mean, I knew not... When I had my baby, I, I, I didn't know where it came from. And when I had my baby, better days. Better days. Now they have the child in front of you. Ugh, you see the whole thing. It's my day. They knocked you out with the first pain. They woke you up when the hairdresser showed. You know how great that was? <laughs> you know how great that was? Miss Rivers, you've had a child. Oh, good, 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 good. Is it healthy? Yes, good, good, good. Is it normal? Yes, good, good, good. Is it white? Yes, good, good, good. <laughs> the marriage continues. Now, <laughs> I'm so damn, I, I, I gotta pick up my own damn, oh, excuse me, I gotta get my own props. I'm so sick of this place. Yeah, now I gotta get up. You know how hard it is at this age? I'm not bitching. It's very easy getting down. It is so damn hard getting up. That's why I never slept with President Clinton. Okay. <laughs> evening in the history of entertainment. Our empires have risen and fallen during the time it took to get through this lot. And now it just remains to me once more to wish your Royal Highness a very happy 60th... 61st birthday. Now, sadly, 